I want clarity. Is it better to ingest fluoride for the health of your teeth or to apply it topically? The main effect from fluoride is the topical effect. I want clarity. Is it better to ingest fluoride for the health of your teeth or to apply it topically? The main effect from fluoride is the topical effect. The topical effect was when um, Dr. Wachowski said, agreed, that fluoride works topically. Now that should be the end of fluoridation. When they admit that fluoride works on the outside of the teeth and not from inside the body, that completely removes the rug from underneath fluoridation. Why on earth, when you know it works topically, and you know that fluoridated toothpaste is universally available. Everybody has access to fluoridated toothpaste. You can brush it on your teeth and spit it out. In this way, you avoid exposing to every tissue in the body to a known toxic substance, and you avoid exposing it to people that don't want it. You avoid violating the individual's right to informed consent. Once she admitted that fluoride works topically, that this is the dominant mechanism, she removed the rationale from water fluoridation. But again, she's trapped because she's a middle-level bureaucrat obeying the orders of the people above who say this practice must continue. Why they think it must continue is up for you to decide. I don't understand why they want to keep this practice going so intensely that they're prepared to send all these bureaucrats from Toronto or Ottawa to, to London to keep pushing and pushing. I don't understand. Toothpaste boxes in the United States of America, they have a warning to go to poison control if you ingest the toothpaste based on the fluoride in it. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. In Canada, we do not have those warnings? In Canada, it says do not swallow. I'm just going to say, nearly all the experts last night were dentists, representing dental organizations. They have something to tell us about teeth, but they have no qualifications to tell us about the dangers that fluoride poses to bones, brains, the endocrine system, the kidney, or any other tissue in the body. So when they say that fluoridation is safe, they are out of order. They are not qualified to tell the public it's safe. All they can say is, we think it's good for teeth. We think it's safe for teeth. They can't even say that because of dental fluorosis. But they certainly are not qualified to say it's safe for the bones, the brains, and the endocrine tissues. And um, look at all the places where it's not available. Now most material data safety sheets aren't like this. Um, here's the section on uh, ecological information. We have no idea what we're doing to the environment because nobody's, nobody's done the test. Wouldn't that be nice if we, we did? Well, um, so, um, my last slide I'll zip, to, zip through. Um, if you take two liters of water a day at the amount we have, really that's a lethal dose spread out, of about, spread out over about five years. Um, this is sodium chloride. This is what you find in toothpaste. Um, is it toxic? Yes. Is it really toxic? Yes. Is it really, really toxic? Yes. <laughs> I'm Joe Cummins. I'm a spirit of marriage is uh, from the University of Western Ontario where I taught uh, advanced genetics, microbial genetics, and uh, uh, environmental pathology and toxicology. Um, now, my concern over the conduct of many during the meetings that uh, was, was particularly exasperating to me was uh, comments from authorities from the university who made uh, the claim that contradicted what my topic is, which was uh, the claim that fluoride was not a genotoxin. It did not injure the genes. But that was a staggering uh, blunder on their part because there are hundreds of papers on the genetic toxicology of fluoride. I've reviewed the majority of the papers in the area and there should be no uh, argument that fluoride is, is, is not a genetic toxin. It is a genetic toxin. I found that disturbing because it was a public relations effort on the part of people with scientific credentials. And people with scientific credentials 
should not prostitute their credentials to produce public relations. So if you were to ask me, and I believe you have, fluoride in the water has definitely not worked for me. And um, I've actually taken a bit of exception tonight to hearing people say that fluorosis is kind of a acceptable collateral damage to fluoride in the water. So my first question is, whose ego are you trying to protect if you decide to continue with this policy? Um, we've heard it already, but just because someone thought this was a good idea years ago doesn't mean that it's actually a good idea today. It seems an extreme example of hubris for members of the medical and scientific community to say that without exception, they know what the effects of fluoride will be on each and every very unique individual. They can't possibly know. And why should we, why should you, me, and every other Londoner be willing to accept their recommendations when there seems to be a growing body of evidence to the contrary? And in a statement last year, Dr. Brian Orshevsky said that 15% uh, of our children are not getting cavities, but that means uh, tragically that 85% of our children are getting cavities and considering the fact that cavities are new to humans we shouldn't be ex experiencing tooth decay at all. Uh, how is it possible for someone to say that fluoride is effective when 85% of our children are getting cavities? Yeah, yeah. We see abscessed teeth, we see swollen faces, we see children crying from painful teeth and we know that ultimately teeth will have to be lost. These are all very real problems associated with cavities in the young child. We also know that children do die from dental decay. The child in this photograph has one visible abscess, and all four of the upper front teeth had to be removed. The child in this photograph has two abscess teeth. The infected teeth had to be removed. As Chief Medical Officer of Health for Ontario, I am very concerned about the loss of fluoridated drinking water in certain communities in spite of consistent evidence that water fluoridation is safe and effective. We've already seen the impact of removing fluoride from municipal drinking water systems here in Ontario. And as was noted in the recent report to Toronto Board of Health on water, water fluoridation, the rate of dental decay in five-year-olds in the municipality of Dryden increased by 26% in seven years after water fluoridation was discontinued. Since fluoridation was stopped in Dryden, Ontario, uh, for seven years, it's been stopped for seven years and tooth decay has gone up. Where is that published? I happen to know, because I was there, that Dryden didn't stop fluoridation to 2008. Wait a moment, 2008, 2008, we're talking three years. So I don't know how these people can think that there's seven years since they stopped fluoridation. If you get a simple fact like that wrong from, from the so-called experts, what does it say about all the other facts? But also, I think at least four times they mentioned that the Center of Disease Control uh, said that fluoridation is one of the top ten public health achievements of the 20th century. There are not many public health achievements, by the way, you know, seat belts and so on. They're not saying very much. But you've got to know that this, center, this quote from the Center of Disease Control is not coming from this big federal agency of 16,000 people in Atlanta, Georgia. It's coming from 30 people. It's coming from the Oral Health Division. It's coming from 30 people who are dentally trained, whose job is to promote fluoridation. So to use this statement from these people as if it's some kind of um, objective analysis of both the effectiveness and safety of fluoridation is a joke. It's a sick joke because if you look at the report in which it's based, number one, it was six years out of date on the health literature that we reviewed, and the evidence that it actually worked is so pathetic. It would a, 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 an undergraduate, I would have failed if they had produced that in a, in a paper term paper. And it was because of the children that Dr. Weston A. Price set out to do his research back in the 1920s and 30s. What he noticed was, in his child patients, is he started to see several cavities in his children for the first time. Now, he was treating the parents of these children, and the parents, it was rare to see any cavities in the parents whatsoever. So he was very curious as to why, suddenly, in one generation, he started to see outbreaks of dental caries. So what he did was he traveled around the world visiting several countries 
and he examined the diets of many different cultures and he compared their diets with uh, their overall health and their dental health as well. Now he took hundreds of pictures in several different areas of the world and I'm only going to show you a couple uh, of examples. One is in the South Pacific and now the teenage boys that he took pictures of in this village. What he noticed in this village was that dental cavities were extremely rare. They had beautiful teeth, they had straight teeth, and overall excellent health, and their diet did not include any of our modern westernized industrialized foods. They ate their traditional diet and, uh, and basically enjoyed uh, overall health because of it. And then when he visited neighboring villages and tribes, uh, what had happened was where they were importing modern foods, he also noticed rampant tooth decay and modern diseases. So you see the dramatic differences in terms of their oral health from one tribe or village to another. And here he runs into, in this case he was off the uh, Scottish coast and he met these two brothers. The one brother had excellent dental health and he had maintained his primitive diet and the, the other brother had rampant tooth decay and he had, began, he had uh, begun eating modern foods like white bread, jam, highly sweetened coffee, and sweet chocolates. And his father complained that this brother also had trouble getting out of bed in the morning. And another observation by Dr. Weston A. Price was that the senior citizens did not need false teeth, false teeth, that they were able to retain all of their teeth, many of them, to an old age. And there were several components of a healthy diet, one of them being, of course, that they did not eat industrially processed foods, that a lot, large majority of them had emphasized healthy fats like butter, meat, and egg yolks in their diet. These are the foods, unfortunately, that we are told to stay away from. And there's too much at stake. I'm just going to finish up by saying, considering how sick our children are today, and the fact that an astounding 85% of them have cavities rather than adding a chemical to our water supply, it's clear that our time and money would be better spent protecting them from industrially processed foods. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah.